Our app loads all the storm images correctly, but it doesn't do anything interesting with them. Printed to the Xcode console is helpful for debugging, but I can promise you it does not make for a best-selling app. To fix this, our next goal is to create a user interface that lists the images so users can select one. UIKit, the iOS user interface framework, has a lot of built-in user interface tools that we can draw on to build powerful apps that look and work the way users expect. For this app, our main user interface component is called UI Table View Controller. It's based on UI View Controller, Apple's basic type of screen, but it adds the ability to show rows of data that can be scrolled and selected. You can see UI Table View Controller in the Settings app, in Mail, in Notes, in Health, and many more. It's powerful, flexible, and extremely fast, so it's no surprise it gets used in many apps. Our existing view controller screen is based on UI view controller, but what we want to have is it based on UI table view controller instead. This doesn't take much to do, but you're going to meet a new part of Xcode called Interface Builder. We'll get onto that in a minute. First though, we need to make a small change to viewcontroller.swift on this line here. That's the line that says, create a new screen called view controller and have it build on Apple's own UI view controller screen. I want to change it so it actually builds on UI table view controller instead. It's only a small difference, but it's an important one. It means view controller now inherits its functionality from UI table view controller instead of UI view controller, which gives us a huge amount of extra functionality for free, as you'll see in a moment. Behind the scenes, UI table view controller still builds on top of UI view controller. This is called a class hierarchy and is a common way to build up functionality quickly. We've changed the code with ViewController so it builds on UI table view controller, but we also want to change the user interface to match. User interfaces can be written entirely in code if you want, and many developers do just that. But more commonly, they're created using a graphical editor called Interface Builder. We need to tell Interface Builder, usually just called IB, that our view controller class is a table view controller, so it matches the change we just made in our code. Up to this point, we've been working entirely in the file viewcontroller.swift, but now I'd like you to use the Project Navigator, as this thing on the left here, to find and open the file main.storyboard. Storyboards contain the user interface for your app and let you visualize some or all of it on a single screen. When you select main.storyboard, you'll switch to the Interface Builder Visual Editor, and you should see something like this. You might have your right-hand side window open, but this thing is the same either way. This big white space in the middle, that's what produces the big white space when our app runs. If we drop new UI components into that space, they'll be visible when the app runs. However, we don't want to do that. In fact, we don't want that big white space at all. So we're going to delete it. The best way to view, select, edit, and delete items in Interface Builder is to use the document outline, but there's a chance it will be hidden for you. So the first thing to do is to show it. You want to go to the editor menu up here, then choose show document outline. Now mine's showing already, so mine says high document outline, but yours is hidden, it will show this, show document outline, like that. So you can show it or hide it freely but I prefer to have it showing nearly all the time. It's the best way to work with Interface Builder. The document outline shows you all the components in all the screens in your storyboard. And we should see already this view controller scene, which you can open up and look inside if you want to. But we don't want this thing. So please select it, then press backspace on your keyboard to delete it. Instead of a boring old UI view controller, we want a fancy new UI table view controller to match the change we made in our code. To create one, we want to show the object library, and you can do that by clicking this button up here in Xcode's navigation bar, or by pressing Command-Shift-L. This shows the object library. The object library floats over the Xcode window and contains a selection of graphical components you can drag out and rearrange to your heart's content. It contains quite a lot of components, so a good idea is to type in a few letters to filter the box down to what you actually want. Right now, the component we want is called Table View Controller. If you type table into the filter box, you'll see three options appear. 
table view, table view cell, and table view controller. They are all different things, so please make sure you select the table view controller. It has a yellow background behind it. Just drag it out into the large open space that exists where the previous view controller was. When you let go, it'll drop this new table view controller onto the storyboard canvas. I should transform to a screen that looks like mine. Before we're done here, we need to make a few small changes. First, we need to tell Xcode that this storyboard table view controller is the same one we have in code inside viewcontroller.swift. To do that, we want to activate the identity inspector, which you can go to in a number of ways. Uh, Alt Command 3 is the most common, or you can browse to it using these options across here. The identity inspector is this one here. As you can see, it has a class here that's set in gray to be UI table view controller. That is default value. But we can also click this arrow to select a new kind of class from our code and choose view controller. That's our custom view controller class. So please select that now. Second, we need to tell Xcode that this new table view controller is what should be shown when the app first runs. To do that, we want to go to the attributes inspector that's one to the right. And then check the box saying is initial view controller. Third, you want to use a document outline to look inside this new table view controller. You'll see a table view inside it, then a table view cell, then a content view inside that. A table view cell is responsible for displaying one row of data inside a table. I'm going to display one picture name in each cell. So please select your table view cell now. Then, in the Attributes Inspector, enter the text Picture into the text field marked Identifier, just here. While you're there, change the Style option from Custom to be Basic. Finally, we're going to place this whole table view controller inside something else. It's something you don't need to configure or worry about, but it's an extremely common user interface element on iOS, and I think you'll recognize it immediately. It's called a navigation controller, and you'll see it in action in apps like Settings and Mail. It provides a thin gray bar at the top of the screen, and it's responsible for that right to left sliding animation that happens when you move between screens on iOS. To place our table view controller into a navigation controller, all you want to do is go to the editor menu, then choose Embed In, then Navigation Controller. And there we go. Interface Builder will move your existing view controller to the right and add a navigation controller around it. You should see a simulated gray bar at the top here showing you what it would look like inside a navigation controller. It will also move the Is Initial View Controller property to the navigation controller. So that's this little arrow pointing to the navigation controller right here. At this point, you've done enough to take a look at your results of your work. Go ahead and press the play button or press command R. Once your code runs, you hopefully will no longer see that plain white screen anymore, but instead see a large empty table view. And if you drag your mouse around, you'll see this thing scrolls like a regular table view, including bouncing at either end. Although obviously there's no data in there just yet. You should also see this gray navigation bar at the top. That will be important later on. The next step is to make our table view show some data. Specifically, we wanted to show the list of NSSL pictures, one per row. Now, Apple's UI table view controller type provides default behaviors for lots of things, but by default, it says there are zero rows. If you remember over in viewcontroller.swift, we said that our view controller screen builds on UI table view controller. And as a result, it gets to override the default behavior of Apple's table view to provide customization where needed. You only need to override the bits you want. The default values are all sensible. To make the table show our rows, we need to override two behaviors, how many rows should be shown and what each row should contain. This is done by writing two specially named methods. When you're new to Swift, it might look a bit strange at first, so, to make sure everyone can follow along, I'm going to take this really slowly. This is, after all, the very first project. Let's start with a method that sets how many rows should appear in the table. After the end of view did load, we're going to add a new method. I'll, I'll close this pane here to make more space. It's a bit of a long method, this one. I'll say number of rows 
and you'll see in Xcode's code completion, number of rows in section appears. I'll select that by pressing enter and I'll return pictures.count. Now, this method uses table view three times, which is deeply confusing at first. So let's break down what it means. Again, we have the override keyword here, meaning this thing is changing a behavior it got from its parent class. It's changing the number of rows in section method to mean something new. Then func, it's a method, and the method's called table view. Yes, that might not seem a helpful name for a method, but the way iOS works is the parameters inside the method decide what actually happens. In this case, the first thing passed in is a table view. But the second parameter is the important one, number of rows in section. How many rows should be shown in this section? So this thing shows table view three times. Table view here, and here, and here. And what it's telling us is this is the table view that triggered this request. This is the one asking how many rows should be in this section. The section part is here because table views can have multiple sections, like the way the contacts app separates names by the first letter. Now we're going to have one section in this app because it will show all our pictures in one section. So we ignore this number. But we do need to return an int from this, a number. That's what the method promises will do. So we're going to return pictures.count. We want as many cells as we have pictures, one cell for each picture. Now this method isn't something we call ourselves. It's called by iOS automatically when it wants to know how many rows are in a section for a table view. I'm not gonna pretend it's easy to understand how Swift methods look and work, but the best thing to do is not to worry too much if you don't understand right now. After a few hours of coding, they'll be second nature. So that's the first of two methods we need to write to complete the stage of the app. The second is to specify what each row should look like, and it follows a similar naming convention to the previous method. Below number of rows in section, I'll add a new one. I'll type cell for, then use co-completion to write cell for row at. Inside there, I'll say let cell equals table view dot dq reusable cell with identifier four. Our identifier is picture, and four will be index path. Then with that cell, I'll say cell dot text label uh, capital L question mark dot text equals pictures index path dot row then return cell let's break it down again so you can see exactly how this thing works again we have override here this is changing the default behavior from our table view controller parent class and again it's called table view as a method and it'll pass in the table view it's making the request as its first parameter but second Cell for row at is the important part of the method name. It's called cell for row at, and it'll be called when you need to provide a row. The row to show is specified at this parameter here, index path, and it's some kind of index path. This is a type that contains both a section number and a row number. We'll only have one section here, so we can ignore that and just use the row number. And you'll see this thing is going to return a UI table view cell. This method must return a table view cell. If you remember, we have one already inside Interface Builder. We gave it the identifier picture, so we're going to use that. Now here's where a little bit of iOS magic comes in. If I go back to the simulator here, then press Command Shift H to go to the home screen and look for settings. This is a table view as you can see. And what you'll see is this thing on the screen only has space to show a certain number of cells, depending how big your screen is. Here, it'll fit maybe 10 or 12, or maybe slightly more at any given time, depending on the size of your phone. To save CPU and RAM time, iOS only creates as many rows as it needs to work. When one row moves off the top of the screen, iOS will take it away and put it into a reuse queue ready to be recycled into a new row that comes in from the bottom. This means you can scroll through hundreds of rows a second, and iOS can behave lazily and avoid creating any new table view cells. It just recycles the existing ones. This functionality is baked right into iOS, and that's what this line of code does here. Let cell equals table view dot dq reusable cell. 
That creates a new constant called cell by dequeuing a recycled cell from the table. We give it an identifier, which should match what we wrote inside Interface Builder, which was picture. And we also pass in the index path that was requested. This gets used internally by a table view. And that will return to us a table view cell we can work with to display information. You can, if you want to, create your own custom table view cell designs if you want. Much more on that later on. But here we're using the built-in basic style that has a text label. That's where the next line comes in. It gives the text label of the cell the same text as a picture in our array. So the cell has a property called text label, but it's optional. There might be a text label or there might not be. If you had designed your own, for example, there wouldn't be. Rather than write checks here to the text label or not, we use this question mark to use optional chaining. It means do this only if there is an actual text label there or do nothing otherwise. We want to set this text label to be the name of the correct picture from our pictures array. That's exactly what this next piece of code does. Index row will contain the row number we've been asked to load. So we're going to use that to read the corresponding picture from the pictures array here and place that into the cell's text label. The last line is return cell. Remember, this method expects a table view cell to be returned. So we've got to send back the one we created. With those two pretty small methods in place, you can run your code again now and see how it looks. All being well, we should see 10 table view cells, each one with a different picture name inside. If you click one of them, it should turn gray, but nothing else will happen. We'll fix that next.